Hi, Dick. Just uh, I'll, I'll invite you just in a few seconds time. I just want to more of our followers to join us uh, so we can start on time. Okay, I'm like with you. Hi. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. So great to see you. Oh my God, look, look, look what we are both wearing. Yeah, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Versace. Versace. Well, well, somehow I knew you're going to wear Versace because it's you know, something very colorful. So I, in my mind, I kind of said, okay, I'm going to wear something colorful as well. That's great. Yes. Well, thank you, my dear, so much for uh, joining me at Conversations with Olga. And uh, um, I can see so many of our friends are joining in. So I will uh, not, uh, I will basically will not wave all the time, but just in the beginning, just to a few of our friends and because they will keep on adding. Um, and uh, I know this is probably the first time you're doing IGTV. So I'm so grateful that uh, yeah. uh, you are with me this first time and I will say a few words about conversation with Olga. I will say a few words about you because there is so much to say, but I shouldn't be the one who's saying all this. It will be you who will be uh, talking about yourself. Okay. okay? <laughs> so, um, hello everyone. Good evening, Singapore. Good evening, Asia. Good morning, New York and good afternoon, London and Europe. Thank you very much for joining me at Conversations with Olga. Tonight is my episode number 24, and I will just say a few words about Conversations with Olga, because some of you, you might not be, uh, you, you might not join me before, so just a few words. I've started Conversations with Olga uh, during the circuit breaker last year. It's an IGTV series fe featuring intellectual and cultural uh, exchange between influential uh, people from all over the world and my dear friends whom I met, whom I was privileged to meet during my career, um, in hopes to inspire and cultivate a more diverse and inclusive community. As I said tonight, is my episode number 24, <laughs> and I am so privileged to welcome my dearest friend, Dick Lee. Uh, I will be uh, briefly saying, as I said, a few words about you, Dick, just a little short bio, and then we'll, before we start uh, uh, talking about you, about your life, and uh, about your um, journey. So, um, first of all, Dick, I would like to wish you again happy birthday because we just, all of all the countries celebrated your birthday just uh, recently. You. So, happy birthday again and again and again and again. You. Um, you are a performer, composer, director, producer, designer, an artist, filmmaker, and often you are recognized as a phenomenon for the new Asian generation. Um, I will uh, read a little bit of your bio, the one that I just put together and what I know. Uh, the Dick Lee phenomenon started in 1971 when Dick was at age 15. Dick participated in various talent contests with the group Harmony and Dick and the Gang, teaming with his siblings. His first album, Life Story, featuring his own compositions, was released in 1974. Wow. Throughout the Right? Yes, I know I'm talking at the, like, you know, like about this, but oh. it's all you, my dear. I have to, I have to tell people about you. So you can blush a little bit, but not too much, okay? I'm sure you're used to it. Uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, Dick championed the inclusion of Asian elements in pop music. The song he's proudest of writing is one of Singapore's most popular national songs, Home composed in 1997 and sung by all of us in Singapore to this day. Besides Home, Dick has written two other songs for National Day. We will get there and for Singapore 50th uh, anniversary signature song, Our Singapore. Apart from music, Dick's other passion is the theater works that comprise of a number of acclaimed musicals, including Beauty World in 1988, Fried Rice Paradise, 
and Forbidden City that was uh, uh, brought, uh, that opened Esplanade in 2003. And in 2015, uh, you Dick wrote the music for the, uh, for the acclaimed musical production LKY, the musical, which celebrated the life of our founding father, Lee Kuan Yew. Dick, you are an associate director of Singapore Library Center, and I have had the privilege to work with you on a number of fundraising uh, events for the SRT, and thank you for that. You have a passion for passion, uh, as we all can see and can know about it. You designed for the boutique Ping Pong, as well as the Singapore department stores. You have worked with Singapore labels, Celia Law and Island Shop. You had a colorful career in the arts world, Dick, and you have won many awards. If I would have started to list all the awards that you won, I think we would just have to just basically sit there and listen to the number of every single award. But uh, uh, the one of the major awards, of course, is the Lifetime Achievement Award that you, got, you received in 2017. So it's incredible. I'm so thrilled to have you at Conversation with Olga tonight and to chat with you. Uh, it's not only my immense pleasure, but it's also an inspiration to me and to all of us. Um, and um, it's sort of like our usual chats that we have with you at our private lunches or gatherings. And uh, it's just talking about good old days, isn't it? Um, so, Dick, I've attended many of your concerts, of course, and I think most of them in the past 20 years. And one of the most special ones, to be honest with you, was the recent one during the last year, right? Was it this year or last, last year in, Dece in December? And uh, uh, where you shared your life's journey with your fans. It was very small and very, very intimate, and I must say that I've cried from the beginning till the end. So shall we, yes, it's true. So shall we start with a little bit with your life story? And uh, as we have a, an international audience and some of uh, people who join us tonight, tonight might not know uh, uh, how the star was born. So um, I would say you're the big, one of the biggest ambassadors of Singapore and uh, it expresses through your songs and through your musicals and the, all the other activities that you are involved. So um, in the, if, if uh, I would give you five words to express your sentiments about your home, about Singapore, what would it be? Five words? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, yes, not five cents because we don't have... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess, I mean, home is the first thing because, you know, uh, one of the main um, one of the main issues that I had in my life doing my works was was regarding identity, and uh, it was very. It took me a long time to find my identity through my work, and even as a, as a human being, because Singapore is only what fifty. What is it now? Fifty six years old. I mean, it's a young country, and. Um, I think um, in the early part of our history from 1965, there was, uh, you know, Singapore was basically trying to get out of, um, of, of, uh, of trouble and just trying to find its footing, try, you know, come out of the third world status. And there was no real thought to identity and, and um, that especially national identity uh, and cultural identity. Because we are an immigrant, uh, we are a multiracial country with... Yes. Uh, Immigrants and Indian immigrants of the Malay originals that were here, and every it was all mixed up. So it was very hard as a child for me and all Singaporeans, I think, to uh, really find uh, identify ourselves as Singaporeans. Yeah. A big, big problem. And um, if uh, linked with that was a sense of home. So I would say the first word I think of is home because I feel that now in in actually fifty short years we found it. I found yeah. it. I feel. I know where home is, I know where I belong, I know who I am. And this, this, is, this is quite a journey. I mean, my main musical journey comes, is linked to this search. Absolutely, yes. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to know your family, to get your family, to get to know your family very well, your parents and your brothers. And uh, I've been present for uh, some of the traditional evenings or gatherings. What are the most important traditions that you've been carried over from your family to, for, to you and to your brothers? 
the sense of family is is has always been a very strong element in in our lives even um because also there were there were five of us i also have i have three brothers and i had a, a late sister she passed away some many years ago but uh when we grew up it was like you know it was like um, a big group of people to play with and then our parents our mother especially was 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 very much a part of it i remember yeah. we were very small she because she she used to love dancing she used to play records and, and teach us how to dance so when we were 10 years old and i was 10 years old i could do the cha cha i could do the mambo <laughs> everything like that yes. so this was the kind of life that we had at home full of love full of music yes. of uh, you know gatherings and um yeah i think i think um this 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 is uh, every celebration was a was a big event um, yeah chinese new year you know everything so all, all the events are part of the glue that uh, kept us together that kept us together yes because you know as they say the walls talk can't they in your home especially and uh, you know you grew up in uh, such a colorful uh, and traditional but yet extremely open minded family i should say uh and uh, i think that's something that uh, uh obviously uh been said about your parents can you say a few words about your parents well they're gone and i miss them so very much uh but the uh, the tradition we we can be on the tradition me and my brothers to um we celebrate them we celebrate each other we celebrate all our birthdays and every christmas we go back and and you know all, all of that in their honor as well so um my mo- my parents were very different they my father was 13 years older than my mother so she married when she was 20 and he was 33 and he he was a very very serious a kind of quiet man and she yeah. was, you know she was she loved music and then and she was always entertaining people i i think i get a lot of that from her um and when i was a kid she allowed me she encouraged me and allowed me to express myself creatively so i really owe a lot to her and my father would be very upset when i would be you know doing crazy things like coloring my hair and she wait wait let let him let him let him um let him do it it's just a phase of course it wasn't a phase <laughs> i know yes. but it allowed me to to be who i am really and yeah. she was there you know at my shows and when i was writing music she was always su- supporting it yes yeah so well, i wouldn't be doing any of this with if not for her support that's wonderful so you know you just mentioned that uh, uh it allowed you to be who you are so can you tell us what defines dick what, what what defines you i think that um i'm very curious I think that is the thing that has uh, led me to to try things and to to do different things. I I I'm curious about everything. I want to know everything and um whatever I admire, I want to emulate. I want to copy. And this is how I started writing songs because I like the songs I heard so I tried to write. I remember when um when I was learning piano, I was maybe 8 years old and then I found out that I read that Mozart was a child genius. and he wrote music and i said okay he was eight i'm eight i will write music of course my <laughs> my music was like three notes but I still, matter, right? yeah i still tried so i think that curiosity maybe is is one of the words that describe me but um if you ask me what how i describe myself today what's my occupation i i would say first because i i've tried so many things in my life but the first yes. almost i'll say composer composer yeah sense of me yes uh and you know you just mentioned the, the uh, mozart i just out of curiosity and uh, uh if you are to mention the most favorite composer of music what would it be oh bach johann bach Bart. really why um i love the i love the way uh, his music well baroque music in general but his music is so it's almost mathematical although i'm terrible at maths but the most mathematical i can ever be but because his music especially the fugues the way yes. they yes. yes the way they structure yeah they're really beautiful and i mean uh, yeah. during covid last year i picked up the yeah. piano and then started looking at my bark and analyzing and i really suck at it <laughs> but 
it was it's just not to play but to study and to sort of to look at all the notes, how they work together i love that amazing when if, uh, if you are to be asked what about the singapore in the past what era or perhaps period pops up in your mind that uh, is more special or perhaps most favorite for you? For me, it would be the 70s because it was my coming of age. Uh, and so at that time was not, uh, was wild, you know, it was, um, I mean, you, you would not have recognized it. I, you know, we, when we were kids and we started going clubbing very young, at 14, 15 years old, we were all dressing up. And those days you dress up, you know, to go out. Now you dress, yeah. right? But before everybody was dressed Love up. You. Yeah, we, we would try to look older and go get into the clubs yeah. at that age limit. And we would, um, we, everything, and this is something I can't, I can't imagine, you can't imagine that. Orchard Road was the center of everything. The shopping, the nightlife, everything was on Orchard Road. So we were just there, you know, um, in the daytime, hang out. And at night, we would club there. After the clubs closed, there were all night cafes there, all down the, the whole road. It was full of people at night. It's just something oh different. Yeah, it was so different. Not, not like now. <laughs> now it's sounds, just... like, sounds like Europe in the summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that because all the clubs were there. So... Yeah. That's that's what I did. I mean, we it was a whole it was a beautiful time because we were free. There was, I mean, um, there were there were the laws were not so strict. You know, everybody was a little bit wild. <laughs> Everyone was uh, going crazy, and it was just fun. And the music, of course, I love the seventies music because yeah. if you think about it, the seventies has such a wide uh, range of different styles. You can go from heavy metal like Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin, and then you can go into the the, the, the bubblegum pop, you yes. know, says all the pop music, and then there, and then you have disco. You know, you have the yes. Bee Gees, Donna Summer, yes. all within ten years. You know, it was just we, there was just so much choice. We went and we learned so much because, um, you know, with all these different styles of music comes the trends. And that's how I learned about fashion. I mean, it's through music yep. because every every genre of music comes with a different style, right? Yes. A different, yeah. Very true. And now it's all coming. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's all coming back. I'm wearing a flared pants again. Yes, you see. <laughs> Here you go. Yes, yeah, so, you know it's always the case actually. After the war, after the pandemics, uh, the life becomes more colorful and more rich and sort of goes a little bit on a, diff on a tangent. So I think uh, it's going to happen here as well. Dick, I know for a fact that you have a very good sense of humor. And this is another talent that I think has been very evident to, in many of your songs and of course in expressing yourself in general. Does it run in the family? And uh, I've heard uh, it might be partially genetic. Well, it is definitely from my mom because, okay, my father, definitely not. <laughs> I never heard him laugh at all in his life, but um, oh, really? yeah, not laugh out loud. He might smile, he might get the joke, but he wouldn't, um, um, but except my mom. My mom was just like always telling jokes, dirty jokes, you know, um, and she just found a funny um, side of everything. And I learned that from her, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That's that's. I think it's much easier to live uh, your life when you when you joke or, or when you accept the joke and when you have a smile on your face, for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about your talent. You know, uh, as we know, in order to succeed, we need talent. We also need, of course, the hard work. And uh, uh, I know it's a fact, so I'm not uh, really disclosing anything that you failed your grade six piano exam, but. It certainly didn't stop you to pursuing your dreams. Uh, what is an inspiration? And yes, uh, tell me. I guess I mean if you think about my 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 musical history, it's I don't know if many people know this, but you know why I can why I play the piano at all because when I was six years old, my mother won a piano in oh, right. a, oh yeah, and that's how the piano ended up in. I was six and, and um, she made me take piano lessons, me and my sister and I think maybe one brother. And then she herself took piano lessons. 
So we all went to learn the piano, you know, just because it was sitting there in the house. And I hated the lessons. I was very angry with my mother. But then I found a way to enjoy playing by not just learning what the pieces we were supposed to, to learn. I mean, I, I was inspired by Mozart. I was inspired by the music that I heard. And I just wanted to copy. By Mozart or his age? <laughs> Mozart, Mozart, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. the fact that he was a kid and I was a kid, you know, that was good. But then at around that time, I started to listen to pop music when I was about nine, ten years old. And that's mm -hmm. where it started to change. And I think my first pop songs were written when I was about um, 12, 11, 12 years old. And then when I was 10 years old, I, I'll never forget, my mother took me to see a pantomime, a Christmas pantomime. I think it was Cinderella. And it was done mm -hmm. by Beach Club. And they used to do it every year. Like the way Wild Rice, you know, our theater company, they do a, a, pan, a panto every year, which is about a fairy tale. And it was yeah. the first time I saw a stage show with, um, with live people singing. And, and it was funny and full of costumes. And then not long after that, I, I saw The Sound of Music the movie mm. and then right away i started to write a musical so you know i just wanted to copy the people that i admired and so that that was so i take inspiration in all the beautiful things and and whatever i see that's fun and exciting and i want to just try and you know try and be part of it or do something it doesn't always work out but i yeah. think uh, i think everybody should try in fact um when I get a lot of uh, young songwriters writing to me, sending me their songs and asking me for advice, and when they're new, I always tell them, copy. Copy your favorite so uh, songwriters. Try and pretend you're writing for your favorite singer because mm -hmm. they learn about different styles. Don't be so original. Don't try to be so original right at the start. You know, Just take your yeah. time and experiment, but copy. First. That actually brings me. That actually brings me to the to the question: Are you critical to yourself, and who is your biggest critic? Wow, I guess I I must be. I mean, usually, um, but I try not to. Um, you know, sometimes it can be really bad. I mean, it can be destructive. You know, because nothing is ever finished. No song is perfectly comp finished. You know, like no painting is finished. You know, I know every artist wants to add a bit more color, you know, a bit more paint. Um, yeah, but I think um, I use, you know, you know, there are these critics, right? I mean, we have, we, can we talk about critics? Because, you yes, know, please, yes. they guide you. I mean, there are some critics that you respect and some, you know, you don't, but I think you have to take, you have to take it all. But now the internet has brought on a whole different uh, level. Has taken yes, it is, yes. There are haters, you know, and there will always be. Um, and what I always tell people, you know, I, I, I know a lot of um, young singers, not only singers, but anybody who's had, you know, terrible um, uh, responses on the internet. And I always tell them, listen, hey, I think I've had my whole life of them, you know. I've had, <laughs> I've had critics, I have, I've had haters from day one, even before there was the internet. So the jealousy. Yeah, I don't know, whatever it is, or some people are just, you know, nothing else better to do. Or, yes, true. Or they have a point, but they don't really know how to put it across, and it comes yes. across, you know, evil. <laughs> but yes. I learned to live through them, and I learned to help them, you know, they help, help me get better. Sometimes they are right, you know. Um, but I think we just have to believe in ourselves. I think we have to be our own. Yes, best. absolutely. Have and you know, talking about believing yourself and your heritage, you know, you, your heritage is Piranakan, you are Singaporean, you are studied Malay in school. Is the identity an integral part of your songwriting and the, or your journey, your, your creative journey in general? What, what was it? What is you your, uh, your uh, heritage, your identity, oh, is an integral part of your uh, songwriting? Not really, because, um, you know, the Pranakans, when I was, my grandmother and my, my relatives would speak Malay. Um, it's a language, I mean, I can, I'm, I'm quite okay talking in the Baba Malay, um, but it's not, <laughs> it's not easy to put into, into music. Um, yeah. I would say that the Pranakans have a kind of a spirit, 
which is which is different and i think it's the malay heritage mixed up that that sort of like gives us a little bit yeah. more ex- i mean we are quite expressive maybe we are more expressive than uh typical chinese um and how i manifest that is in my music and my yeah. you know yeah for sure and that brings me to the question when you create in general when the ideas come to you do they come first to your mind or to your heart oh you know okay there's a there's a big um there's a big problem nowadays in what i do because i work i i, I do my art in the commercial world and nowadays before when i was 10 years old i just wrote a musical because it was just like something fun i wanted to do yeah when i was 15 16 years old i wrote songs i just wrote songs because i wanted to express myself and there no nobody yeah. asked me. but nowadays when you want to do a musical and i think you know this you have to think of how much is going to cost and how are you going to sell yeah. the tickets and will people want to see this show i mean you know we may have some idea about doing a musical about you know whatever but will people want to see it yes going to get the money to do it. so everything becomes so yes. the the creative decision has to be based on the commercial viability yes comes a, a tricky thing especially in songwriting which is one of the reasons why i gave up songwriting uh, com- uh for you know for the music industry is because um the way it works is that you have all these publishers you have rec- okay you have record companies that represent singers and then you have music publishers that provide songs to the record companies so that they right. can choose them for the singers so you don't want you want to make as a songwriter you want to make money you can't i mean you know you can't just write what you want you have to write for that singer that the the, re- the record company is looking for songs for the singer A and he tells the publisher and the publisher tells us that the singer it's A it's the machinery yeah so i have to look look listen to singer A and and see what style they are and then try and write a song for them so it's not really pure expression anymore Got but it. it's my it's the industry is my work so you know you have to do it or you don't do it so i don't exactly. do it i just exactly. give it up yeah Yes. You know, we always in the even when we get together there just two of us, we talk about everything and anything. And you know, I'm always uh, incredibly uplifted by your zest uh, for life. Uh, what drives you? I think it's important to believe in something um that is very personal to you. I mean, you could go to work and it may not be a job that you enjoy anymore or something, but if you don't have that a passion for something else, you just a shadow of yourself going through your life and uh, sort of like in a sort of yeah. meaning you know so yeah I, i encourage always people to find something whatever it is you know and and um that's how i've survived so long in this career <laughs> you know it's 40 over years of reinventing myself because yeah. you can't just, i can't allow myself to stagnate and, yeah. and because i want to keep working is because I just have new interests and when when things change and I I say oh what's this like you know I will I will try and go that way and then from there it opens other doors there's Absolutely. avenues that open if you go and look for them yes But, uh, are living this way and they just sail through their life and it's not a bad thing too but I think we only have one life and um look I just turned 65 you know what I mean I have what 20 years left to live I'm going to make it the best 20 years of my no? you know talking about that i don't i know and age is just a number i just actually wanted to uh ask you you know you look forever young how do you do it seriously i know you for 20 over years i give really? you number okay <laughs> <laughs> no i i do well, i do minimal things but you know how like when we were younger in in the in 70s 80s 90s we did facials right Yes. I think now the facial list is a doctor. <laughs> I think nobody goes to that kind of facial anymore maybe in a spa but then the new facial the new <laughs> are doctors so yeah sure there's there's stuff that you can do to brighten up or something. You look absolutely amazing. I think it comes from within as well because yeah. you are forever young in your soul and heart. That's you, why you're so active. If you're not no matter what you do to your face you'll still not have that 
that fire or that exactly exactly, yeah. exactly. and you know um and that brings me to the fire that you give to your fans and to your world and i want to chat a little bit about your fan club in Japan and uh, I would like you to share a little bit about your years that you spent in Japan you have a huge following and even whenever I was present at your concerts uh, like numbers of rows were occupied by your, your friends your guests who flew in especially to see you at the concert here my Japanese fans are the most beautiful thing in the world and I'm so lucky to have them I I, I went to Japan in 1990 and I would say that 90% or 80% of the fans that follow me still that come to shows here almost every year, they were there at the 1990 show. And they were high school or they were in university and others. And some of them bring their daughters. So they are so loyal and they're so, um, they, they're so kind, you know, and, and, and we, you know, they're always in touch. And they actually come here, you know, just to yeah. see. Oh, that is so unbelievable. But the fact is that the whole thing is an incredible blessing. When I was doing my music, when uh, in the okay, my, my first album was in the 1974, but then I didn't have an album f for 10 years. And then I did quite a few albums in the 80s. And I was doing it part time. You know, I had a job, I had a company doing events, and part time I was just making albums and I was uh, doing show uh, concerts, maybe a little bit of concerts. But at that time, I never thought it would go beyond that because I thought, okay, that's the limit. Forever, I'll be just doing this kind of thing. And I'll be happy because I have a nice job and, you know, quite a nice life. I was a yuppie, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that was a good life. Then suddenly, the chance to, to go to Japan just suddenly came and I was really torn. I mean, for, for two months... I was so worried. I was so con thinking, should I go? Should I stay? Should I give up my company? Should I go to Japan? I lost 10 kg, I remember, just from the worry. And then when I decided to go, I just went and my whole life changed. And I never looked back. But, and, and, and then I got all these fans and, and then I went to Hong Kong and then I had my Asian career. So I think sometimes this huge leap of faith is, is necessary. Absolutely. And I was 33, 33 years old. I mean, who, who ever heard of becoming, you know, a musician at that age? I mean, it was, I was too old, you know, everyone was saying, are you sure? And, but, you know, I thought this I is... I say that my son is a uh, movie in the industry and he just turned 33. So please don't say that <laughs> it's an old age. He's <laughs> not an actor, right? He's a, he's a director. That's okay. He's a director, producer. Yeah. <laughs> My first movie like five years ago so <laughs> that's okay but you know to be a uh, singer i mean that's a whole other thing and go to japan i didn't know anyone i couldn't speak japanese yes. it was so frightening but i'm yes. so glad yes and we have i can see a lot of uh, fans are joining us tonight and they're all waiting to you so i just oh, apologize that i cannot reply or uh, Dick cannot respond to everybody who is waiting and sending hearts and kisses but we are all very grateful for you um, listening us and yes yeah, so i'm going back to the showbiz uh, you know it's of course it's extremely there are elements in show business and i've observed it uh, through even through my own son or you and some other people whom i know uh that, that could irritate you badly especially if you're a sensitive person and yeah, when you're super talented you still need to struggle in in this show industry mostly probably emotionally um Am I correct? So how do you cope this anxiety? Well, you know, we always say that, you know, like performers, we always get nervous before a show, no matter how many shows you've done. I mean, yeah. the minute you don't get nervous means that you are jaded. And when you are jaded, it means that maybe you're over this industry, you know? I think that you, as long as you have a passion, I mean, we're coming back to the passion, you know? As long as you have the passion and I, I, I do have the passion. Yeah. Um, I still keep, I keep it alive. I keep it alive. And again, what you also just talked about is um, how do I battle, you know, battling the negative aspect of the business. Yes. If you're very successful, you can also lose yourself. You can be so tired. You can have no time for yourself, you know. And then if you're not successful enough, you're frustrated, you know. So 
actually, I think at the end of the day, you got to have the art. I mean, you have to develop your art. And there are people that say that come to to me or my company and they say, "Oh, I want to." They want to be an artist, you know. They ask if they can sign. We can sign them. And when we ask them, "What is it that you love most about, you know, showbiz?" They yeah. said, "So that's all they want." So that's going to be that's you're not going to be very happy, you know, if if that's all, and you don't have anything else yes. make you famous, you know, your looks, okay. But that's yes. that's going to fade, you know, and. Yeah. Need you need more. So I think if you develop, if you want to be in this business, you got to have a gift, and I'm sure you have this gift. But you have to really hone this gift. You have to really work hard, and you have to practice. You have to read and learn and whatever and watch. You know, you just have to work at it because a lot of artists they don't do enough. True. Um, do you have any regrets? Wow, I would say my biggest regret would be um, it's linked to what we just talked about. That there were times in my life when my career was um, was um, I was in the in Jap uh, that whole Japanese period uh, when I was really quite busy. I was going to Hong Kong and I had a career in Hong Kong that started in the early 90s as well as back and forth and coming back here and all that. And it, it did take its toll on me and I found myself just running around, running around. And um, I, at times, I would say, I hope not every time, but I did have, I did lose my temper quite a bit. And that was not nice. And I felt I had to vent it somehow, but you know, you hurt people you love. And that's the thing that I regret most, and I right. and yeah, but um, well, thank you for being honest, and thank well, you for well, I, I sharing that's it. One that's the only one thing I regret. So <laughs> okay, okay. Well, nevertheless, I want to ask you on a little bit on the same subject that you, of course, have been having an extremely illustrious career, but I'm sure you've had some downfalls as well. Uh, for instance, I remember when it was uh, uh, that your, uh, one or two even albums were banned uh, from uh, 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 for the improper use of Singlish. Can you share with us the story? Well, the, the, the ban was linked to um, my identity, the search for my identity, and it was a very confusing time for me. Um, when I did, when I when I um, was writing songs in 1974, and I was taking part in this talent contest, um, I was writing songs and performing. And then for the grand finals of the contest, I wanted to write something that was very Singaporean. Remember, this is 1974. Yeah. And just to give you a bit of context, the pop music scene in the 1960s in Singapore was huge. It was huge. There were bands. There were they were all recording under mainly under EMI and mm -hmm. bands had fans screaming girls and all that and then suddenly the whole thing died in the late 60s because of national service that was one of the main reasons and mm -hmm. made everyone cut their hair and all that and all the band yes. boys army and the music industry basically died now in the early 70s then as a young teenager wanting to do music that was the world I entered a, a dead scene, you know, a dead entertainment scene. And here I am trying to write songs. And I was writing songs that were, I told you, emulating Elton yes. John, my favorite. Yeah. And so for the grand finals of this competition where I was a guest artist, I, would, I wanted to do something um, original, something Singaporean. Okay, at that time, there was no concept of Singaporean. What is Singaporean? How do we... Yeah. So I wrote a song, I put Singlish in it, and I wrote a song about food, and it was a fun song, it was called Fried Rice Paradise. Yes. And that song, yes. yeah, that song was very, it became very popular because it was on the, played on the Rediffusion, and then it was put on my first album. Because from, that, from performing that song, I got my first album deal. When the album came out, immediately the song got banned by the government because of improper use of English. That means the Singlish, they did not approve the yes. Singlish. Yes. I put the Singlish in because I thought that's Singaporean. 
Yes. That in 1974, you know, Singlish was seen was was seen as bad English. So the song got banned. But then, luckily, the song uh, Radio Fusion, which was a cable radio, discovered me, and they're not government, so they yeah. played they played the song all the time, and and thanks to them, I got known. Amazing! And, What a story. Yeah, so so they played it, and then that song is still being performed today. I still perform it. I you know I had two musicals uh, written for it. Yes. And so um, in 1988. 1989, I I was recording my eighth album, okay, and it was uh, the Mad Chinaman, the album that changed my life, the album that introduced me to Japan, and I thought, okay, what is it? 15 years have passed. I think it's time to revisit the Singapore thing again. And yeah. time, don't forget, the national songs had appeared. The national songs that we hear in National Day Parade appeared in 1984. So they started being, you know, by 1988 there were four national songs or three national songs already out, and people were starting to feel a little bit more Singaporean. Yes. And on top of that, in 1988, I wrote a musical with Michael Chiang called Beauty World, and this was my first musical, and it was all about Singapore thing, as the Singlish was in it, and the audience loved it. Yes. So when I did the Mad Chinaman, I said, okay, I'll do a Singlish song. I did a rap. I might be one of Singapore's first rappers. Okay, <laughs> don't laugh. Yeah, that's yes. I, My song was know? rapped in Singlish with three other friends, and the song came out on my album. And the minute it came out, it got banned again, for exactly the same reason as in 1974. It was banned because of improper use of English. So that was very very disappointing because here I am trying to find my identity. And using Singlish, and the government is telling me no, that's not our identity. Yes. But the beautiful thing was that by that time the media uh, supported me; they believed in it, and they wrote, and the band got lifted, and my album became a platinum-selling album because of that. So, I thank the media, <laughs> you know, and they they have been very supportive in my What entire. Oh, fabulous! How many songs all together? Thank you for sharing the story. How many songs all together have you composed? Have you written? Oh, I don't know. Many. You're sorry. Many. Maybe. Okay, that's a good I'm, answer. Not maybe, not a thousand, maybe, but but of many, many hundreds. And and something that people don't know is that most of my songs, I would say, seventy percent of my catalog are Chinese songs. People don't realize. <laughs> Exactly. Not at I, all. Yeah, because of my Hong Kong career and and the yeah. Cantonese mainly. Yeah, Cantonese. Cantonese. You know, talking about the songs, of course, probably the most recognizable song that you've written is "Home." It's mm-hmm. a very special and certainly very nostalgic and patriotic song, and it's pretty melancholic. Uh, it was sung in 1998, correct? Parade. Yes. 1998. Yeah. Can you please tell us a little bit uh, about the birth of this song? Okay, well, um, in 1997, I moved to Hong Kong, right after the handover, and it was a very um, confusing time in Hong Kong because you know, talk about identity. You know, they were all a bit lost. Hong Kong had just returned to China, and I was there, and I had been away for seven years already, and I was working in Hong Kong uh, in Sony Music. And it was a tough job because it was a regional job. I was traveling all the time, and then I was one day I was invited to submit a song for the Sing Singapore campaign, and this campaign was a government campaign to encourage Singaporeans to sing local songs. Mm-hmm. And there were not many local songs at that time, mainly folk songs. Um, so they invited me to submit a song because what happens is that they were. They will have one original song, and then the public will sing it in a kind of contest. And my song got chosen. And something important: the theme yeah. me given to all the composers was the Singapore River. So they actually said, "Write a song about the Singapore River." And I wrote a song about missing Singapore because I was in Hong Kong. I was away yeah. for eight years already. So yeah. I wrote that. Express how I felt, 
that had the word river in it a few times, you know. So that song was chosen for the campaign. And then um, in the committee was the chairman of the NDP for the next year. So he liked the song and he, he put it in. And that song had a bit of controversy because um, it's a melancholic song. Yes. And the other songs that were written pr previously were very rara and very you know, patriotic and, and quite like big. But this one was a kind of a moody song. And it started with a very negative line, whenever I'm feeling low. I mean, which national song <laughs> begins with that? But the, everybody liked the, the sentiment of it. And I think... Yeah, sorry. The song is, I mean, the song is, was chosen or is popular because of, it expresses a kind of a bittersweet feeling for your, for our country. Yeah. I think Do it you think you ought to write the song home right now, the present time? Do you think it would be fundamentally different song? Yeah, because I'm not in Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm sitting here. I mean, that, the, the, the main, the main emotion behind home was the homes, homesickness. And I always hear, you know, people, Singaporeans overseas, when they sing it or hear it, they always feel homesick. And I think that emotion comes through the, the closest. I have read, since written two other National Day songs. Yes. And they're, they're yes. quite, they're more upbeat, they're more positive. Yes. Um, and the last one I wrote also has an interesting story. I wrote the song for the Singapore uh, SG50, 50th yes. anniversary, which I did the national, I was directing the National Day Parade. I wrote the song and we got JJ Lin to sing it. It's a song, you know, kind of like with a chant. Yes. And then just before we were to launch it, uh, Lee Kuan Yew passed away. And then we said, we can't put the song out like that. I mean, you know, so what I did was I was just playing around. I was feeling sad and I was just playing the song in a slow version and I sent it to the chairman and they liked it. And so that song came out first. My version, which is a slow version, mm -hmm. came around just about a month after yeah. um, the, the, the funeral. And then closer to National Day, we put out the fast one. So it wasn't actually meant to be slow and fast. Got it. You know, there is one song uh, that really sort of extremely um, special, and not only to me, but, but to so many others. And I believe you've written that song when you were 16, and uh, the words that are especially very touching to me are maybe, if I have another chance, I'll go into my past and make like, my life a better one for me and you. Can yeah. you, and you know, even now I have goosebumps. Uh, this line is particularly poignant as it echoes definitely nostalgia and I guess something extremely important uh, in your life story. Can you please just, you don't have to say too many things, but if you can just give us a little bit of uh, insight into the song, would be great. Well, the song um, was, when, when I went to audition um, for, the, for the talent show, I sang that song. I, ha I had just written that song and... Um, and it, it's it's a very ironic song because it's about looking back in a life, but I was only 16. I didn't have much of a life. So I just imagine that what it would be like, I was projecting myself like 50 years into the future and thinking, okay, when I look back in my life, um, what would I do to make things better? If there was things to fix, I would fix it. Yeah. In the, the lyric also is like, when it's time and I must close, I'll write a book you know, and I'll sign X, you know, and, and I actually have done all of that, you know, um, it's, it's funny that I, yeah, I lived through that. I, I actually lived the life that the song was singing about, you know, the lyrics are all about. And then it became the title track of my first album. So it's an important song for me. Yes, it's, it's beautiful. I think if you are to be compared to uh, a single star, one star, who would it be in your mind? Don't be humble. You don't have to be humble. Wow, I mean, that is like, I mean, that is so daring of me. I mean, I... <laughs> oh, yes, that's fine. You're... I'm near all the, the stars that, 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 that I, I admire. I mean, they have achieved, you know, incredible things. But 
if you ask me one person that I admire, I mean, um, that I emulate, um, it's Walt Disney, because he was a dreamer and he, whatever he wanted to do, he just made it happen, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I, that's great um, passion and, and a power from that passion. He's, Very true, actually. Yes, yeah. That's, a, that's an incredible answer. I didn't expect that, but thank you for that. Um, you know, uh, to listen to your untold stories uh, along with unreleased songs, and especially at that last concert, uh, it was really extraordinary. Uh, um, how uh, did it make you feel to share publicly so many moving stories uh, from your life? Were you comfortable uh, to talk about it? When I began my career, um, when I started uh, writing songs, that's how I would perform them. I would be at the piano and I would be singing uh, to a small audience and talking about the songs. And the songs that I used to write were storytelling songs. They were songs that were describing yes. part of my life or some yes. incident feeling. And, and I had many years just doing that. And this year when I did that concert, it was really going back to my roots. Yes, it, I felt. It was cathartic for me because that's how I started my career. Before Mad China Man, before anything else, it was just yeah. me singing, you know, <laughs> life story at the school, at the library or school hall, uh, university. I played in the university, Singapore University at lunchtime, you know, things like that. And I really um, want to do that again because, yeah, it's, it's, it's really who I am. And I have, I'd like to um, share with you some exciting news, is that? Yes, please. I have, um, you know, the pandemic has locked me up at home, right? And I dusted my piano <laughs> and I started playing and I played Bach, you know? And then I also started to write songs. And I, I started writing and I wrote so many songs and I hadn't been writing songs for maybe 20, 30 years. I only write songs on commission now, mm. you know? Okay. It, and so it was just a joy, you know, I just started like expressing myself again. Again. And I had this little uh, collection of songs. I sang a couple, I think I sang one of them at the concert you, you went to. Yes. And then I was thinking, what shall I do with these songs? I mean, like, shall I record an album? But that desire to, re the record, to record an album is not something I feel passionate about anymore, you yeah. know. I'm making the music, but this whole business about um, recording and now it's all on Spotify and all of that. So it's a whole different thing. But anyway, I thought, um, how shall I uh, share these songs with everybody? So I decided to find a band and work with a band. And I wanted the band to develop the songs together with me because these are brand new songs. There's nothing for them to copy. Just, we just jam and we just see how what it turns out but yeah. when band, right so i looked around i went everywhere i went on the internet and i actually found i couldn't find an actual band band because these bands are mainly um kids that are at home you know with with their computer yes, and, yes. I did musicians so i i found musicians and i just i just well thank you instagram because it's through instagram that i connected with them I connected with one who introduced another, another, and lo and behold, I have a band. They're called Omnitones, and we Omnitones. are- Omnitones, okay. and- and, uh, and they are 25 years old, so they are like 40 years younger than me, <laughs> but they are great guys. They are, they are very passionate musicians. They're good musicians. We're going to record a single that comes out in December. That's fantastic. And we're going to have a concert in Esplanade in June next year. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Well, yep. I will make sure yep. that uh, everybody knows about it. And please, uh, uh, we look forward. It's incredible. That's, that's I, I wanted to ask you, actually, what's it, it ahead of you? What are your, what your dreams are? And here you go. That's incredible. You know, and this is, goes to power of song. You know, just uh, I listened to one podcast a while ago, uh, discovering the power of the song uh, called Wind of Change by Scorpions. 
Mm. And uh, it's a whole con con conspiracy about the song, but the bottom line is that this song influenced the minds of millions of people and the hearts of millions of people. And when I listen to that podcast, it's actually uh, you were in my mind with the songs that you've composed and created. So really, thank you for that. Uh, I would like to move a little bit. We don't have that much time, so I want to ask you a few questions. A, about the Singapore Repertory Theatre, because uh, you've been involved with SRT for so many years, and uh, um, tell us a little bit about your involvement and what, what, what's, uh, uh, what brings you to the theatre itself. I've been with SRT since um, 1996, and um, it was through a musical that I, I, uh, I wrote for them called Sing to the Dawn. And I'm their associate artistic director. And um, I, well, the, the last year also has been tough for the theater industry. And, yes. and if, but even for me, what I do is mainly musicals. I have done a um, couple of plays with them, but um, musicals, I love to do. And I love doing it with SRT, but it's so expensive to <laughs> stage now. And, you know, with the a, with a audience size and everything, I don't think... It's something that we can do in the in the, in the near future. It may take. Um, I I I have a long relationship with like family, so yes. yeah, I I know if they're going through a tough time, and um, we will bounce back, and we will absolutely, absolutely. We're all working on it very hard, and uh, uh, Dick, uh, as I mentioned before, you're a fashion designer as well. So, what is Dick Lee's style? And I always admire it, your very bold, quirky, contemporary, yet very timeless, timeless style, I should say. I know you love fashion, and your dressing has been admired by many, including me. So can you tell us a little bit about your style? I just love color and print. Um, when I was a child, yeah. I used to go, my mother would take me shopping, and there was one shop in particular, it was Metro. The first Metro store was on High Street. Yeah. And it house and she would go and do something upstairs and she'd say wait here on the ground floor but the ground floor in those days was not cosmetic it was fabrics so right down the whole length of the shop there were rows and rows of printed fabric just not matching and yeah. all and i would be standing there for half an hour looking at them and that has become my aesthetic <laughs> ever since then print big bold print and colorful yes, print yes. I mean, like mix and match, and I just, it just makes me happy. And also, I feel well, I live in the tropics. Yes, very true. That's why your, your shorts that you design, I've seen some of them, they're very colorful and <laughs> just very happy. And it's Pranakan, right? A bit Pranakan. You're you know? Very Pranakan, yes. Um, we, uh, I would like to justify just a few final questions uh, that we move forward to, uh, I know that you have another Zoom call, so I don't want to take too much of a time. Uh, what do you think about the new generation and the millennials, Generation Z and younger uh, might be losing from the days of your earth, your youth, your growing up? Sorry? Are you talking about musicians in particular? I'm talking about in general, the new generation actually, you know, because you... you oh. I mean, they are, they are, I find that the good thing is that they're starting to follow their dreams a lot more. Um, and they are, they're being bolder about, you know, making statements. I think that's good. Um, they just, they are living in a much more competitive world than, mm. than I was when I was growing yeah. up. So they have to find the unique quality in yeah. them or whatever it is that they do, you know. I mean, with the internet, when you put a song out on the internet, you're competing with millions of yeah. people who are all talking about exactly yeah. and talking about that. That's the uh, social media. What is your take on social media? And don't you think that it's uh, it, there is a stress uh, that it has been um, so prominent for the when you are very heavily involved in social media? And would you be on a TikTok? I'm dying. I, <laughs> are you? I, I am, but I just don't have the time to. Uh, you know, I, I'd rather be doing something else than making those videos. Yeah, yeah it's not yeah. Important for me. Um, social media is important for me to reach out to people, especially this period. Yeah. Uh, and 
I have, it's for me to thank my following. Yeah. Look, the reason why I'm still doing what I do is because I have an, the, my audience is still supporting yeah. me. Um, when that stops, I'll stop. But when I do, I do concerts every year because people come to them. It means they, yes. it means they want to see me. Obviously, it means they want to, to see me. And I, 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 I connect, I, I feel obliged, not obliged. I want to give back to them whatever way I can when I can't perform. Yes. It's something that I have a surprise for you. I like surprises from you. I'm at the piano. In every village, there stands a tall and ancient tree, which shelters from the sky above. A tree of hope, a tree of love. It shares our joy and feels our pain. It grows with us through the sun and rain. It stays so green the whole year through. And flowers when a dream comes true. You are heaven's own work of art. Thank you so much. Thank you for lifting my mood. Thank you for inspiring all of us. And thank you for being my very, very dear friend. I'm really, really humbled to have you uh, in my life. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. The episode will be recorded. I will post it on my social media. It will be also available on the YouTube and the okay. conversation with Olga, so I will send you, Dick, of course, the link as well. You can share it with your fans uh, in Japan especially. And um, uh, all my episodes are available on the events of Olga and the conversations. I have many more to come, but tonight was extremely special. It's Thank you, Dick, so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you, again. <laughs> Bye. I will see you very soon. Thank Bye. you. Bye.